Welcome everybody to today's webinar. The topic for today's webinar is CBAT F30, understanding the most unique sonar from Teledyne Marine. Just need to make sure that you all know that this webinar is being recorded. So it's my pleasure today to present the today's speaker, it's Vice President of Business Development of Teledyne Marine Europe, Simon Bashar. While I'm introducing Simon, uh, there will be a short poll on the screen for you to uh, answer to. So Simon has a background in mechatronic engineering with a degree from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. His early career, Simon worked for a small Danish startup developing one of the world's earliest commercial AUVs, working on the platform design as well as sensor integration. In 2004, Simon joined Reason where he has been part of small team developing new products and has since then worked in many roles in the company, including product management, sales and business transformation projects. Simon is, with a lot of other hats, product manager for the Reason forward-looking sonar systems and the Blue U product family. By the end of the webinar, we will have a short poll as well. Uh, and you're welcome to ask questions during the uh, webinar on the on the questions section and with these words i will hand over the microphone to simon hi everybody i see there's some people coming uh, in still so um, we'll get started here thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule your busy day to um, listen to me i'll try to capture your attention and keep this interesting and also try to respond to any questions you have towards the end. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me on social media or by email uh, later on. So diving into it, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're gonna try and cover in this next half hour. And first, I'll give you a brief history of the CVAT F30 to put it into a bit of perspective, uh, the history, um, an overview of the specifications and hardware, um, show some impressive results gathered by one of our first customers, and then I'll dive into the, the more technical aspect of uh, explaining how forward-looking bathymetry works and also how Teledyne Marine's processing chain works with some of the latest results. And, and then I'll try and conclude at the end. So the F30 uh, started its life uh, a long time ago uh, as a sonar that was then known as the CBAT 7130, um, first sold in around 2009. Um, what makes the sonar very, very unique is the combination of forward-looking bathymetry with high resolution, so that the image you see on the top right-hand side, as well as the ability to do 2D high resolution at 635 kilohertz, providing very, very detailed imagery and good detection and visualization of objects on the seabed. Um, this is very unique and um, and really something that is not normally seen in a forward-looking sonar system. Some other aspects of the sonar that make it unique is the fact that it's optimized for use on small AUVs. Uh, the first custom used it on a 12 and 3 quarter inch UV, which is uh, by today's standards a fairly small uh, UV. And since uh, the time when we first developed the sonar as the 7130, we've made a lot of improvements and uh, recently, we, uh, in, in around September 2018, we actually ported the sonar <clears throat> concept over to the latest uh, and greatest platform we have, which is the, the CBAT T-Series platform. So it's really new array uh, technology, new electronics technology, new processing technology, but obviously the same general sonar concept. That brought some of the benefits uh, along with it, such as a valuable space saving. You, you can kind of see it in the picture on the right-hand side the back of the receiver is actually a compatibility bracket. So the receiver itself is almost half the, the size of the previous generation. That's because of all the, the densification and, and reduction of size that we've done on the electronic front. So what does this bring to the customers? Well, you get to save valuable space at the front section of the AUV. We've also increased the depth rating from 3,000 meters to 6,000 meters, which means you have a, a sonar that is more applicable to a wider range of use. Um, the upgrade of the platform bringing in the T-series electronics also has improved the imagery, has reduced noise, and hence provided uh, better results and more consistent results over, over the swath and longer ranges. 
Um, we've also made improvements that allow the SOAR to switch much more quickly between the two mo modes, between the 200 and 635 kilohertz. So you can do a ping pong. And that obviously allows customers to get the more information quicker and get more utility out of this very unique sonar. So not, not intended to dive into too much technical details here because at the end of the day, uh, the spec sheets are all online and you can, you can get a copy of the user manual if you, if you request that from us. Um, the things I'd like to point out is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the receiver has got a lot smaller. You can see the size of it. Uh, I should have something about the scale, but basically we're, we're talking about 123 mils, so about 12 centimeters in, in depth, which is really not that much can, can, in comparison to what the sonar can do. Um, I would also like to point out that the combined weight of the sonar assembly in water is around six and a half kilograms. And if you compare that to two separate sonars, if you take two of the T-series and F-series sonars as standalone units, just on the sonar head alone, you're saving around eight kilograms of weight uh, compared to two separate sonars for the wet ends. And if one considers the processing bottle, which is around 12 kilograms in water, you only need one processing bottle because you've only got one sonar system. So there's a huge uh, reduction in weight uh, because we're combining two capabilities into one. Um, also, the 635 kilohertz is pretty special. It's uh, 512 beams with a 0 0.6 degree center beam width, so very high resolution. And you'll see in the imagery, not only the resolution, but how clean and how low noise it is too, because of the low side load levels and generally very, very good uh, sonar performance. And what makes the sonar unique that I'll repeat many times over, it's this 200 kilohertz forward looking interferometric uh, processing. We have 112 beams, and what I'll go through in the presentation is the explanation of how we get forward-looking bathymetry from those uh, 3D 112 beams. There are two options for the sonar processor. The one option, the standard option, is the 6,000 meter SSP. That's a fully titanium bottle uh, capable of 6,000 meter depth rating, very robust, very con corrosion resistant, and easy to interface to because it has a wide uh, power supply range. So for, from an AUV or vehicle integration point of view, it's pretty handy. For those who would like or have a one atmosphere dry housing, we do also have an alternative option, which we call the SSP Exo for exoskeleton, which is a dry assembly to go in um, a dry compartment. So uh, the most interesting part of the sonar, as I've said, is, is the ability to get 2D forward-looking data. This section is going to show you some of the very, really cool data that uh, one of our first customers, the uh, Newark out of Rhode Island, uh, provided to us. Um, we we're very fortunate to get this data. And um, what you'll see in this data set is really the, the, the thing that's so special about the sonar. So, this data shows how one is able to both have 3D forward looking bathymetry, so ahead of the AUV. In this case, it was an AUV probably sailing, I think, around five meters above the seabed, uh, as well as the 2D imagery. So, what you're seeing in this data set is the wreck of uh, the Cape Fear, which was a concrete hull uh, vessel uh, sunk near the end or built near the end of World War I. The slides here show a 200 kilohertz uh, bathymetric data set where it's a single pass. So you're seeing the, the width of a single pass. So it's a really wide uh, swath. And just for the feeling of scale, you've got a US football field uh, there, which is around, what is it, 70 or 80 meters of width in, in metric terms, uh, approximately. Um, you, the bathymetric data is gridded at approximately half a meter. And the small uh, kind of zoom window is at the same scale as the 2D imagery on the far right-hand side. So I'm gonna just flip to the next uh, slide where you can actually see the data running. And here you can clearly see the level of resolution that the 2D 635 kilohertz gives. So looking at that vessel, you can see a lot of uh, detail. You can see open hatches. Uh, you can see really great shadow detail and clear straight lines and key lines uh, and also objects and debris around the vessel as well on the seabed. 
So really cool data. I think it's absolutely fantastic uh, compared to the fact that this is uh, a forward-looking solar system looking out uh, into the water column. Just another view of some of the data set. Here we've got an unnamed wreck in the Prudence Island area of Rhode Island. Um, you'll actually be able to see if you look closely at the bottom right hand side that you can see some of the structures in the vessel on the 2D data, which just goes to show the resolution at that, that range uh, where you can actually see that some of the deck plates have, have worn away and you can see through the hatches as well. Again, you're seeing the 3D 200 kilohertz bathymetric data as well as this 2D mode uh, and the two modes can alternate between each other. So it's really a very, very unique capability that we have here. One can only imagine the different capabilities one can develop for an AUV being able to see ahead of the AUV for a change. Normally, one's only looking down with a bathmetric system. And now I run the file and you can see the, the video in real time. Again, really good shadow detail uh, and super high resolution, in this case, up, up to 60 meters. At the end of the video, you'll see um, a boy line, and the AUV actually brushed along that boy line. It's the navigational uh, warning boy, and that's what introduced some roll into this data set. So the AUV actually got a bit of roll going because it, it, it whacked the, the line. And here's a different data set. Um, there's some comparison reference bathymetry, most likely from some, some lower resolution system, but you can see in general the bathymetry agrees really well with the reference bathymetry. Um, there's also a side scan data set there just to show the structure, get a different view of it. Um, you can also see at long range here exactly how good the F30 is at resolving a small object. That's a tripod stand. You can see at roughly 70, Yes, 80 meters or so. And just look at the shadow detail that required extremely good acoustics to get that level of shadow detail, very low side lobe levels. And um, yeah, even an uneducated eye can pretty much see that that's some kind of tripod on, on the screen. So, um, and again, at the top, the 2D, uh, sorry, the 3D uh, forward looking bathymetry with the football field of scale, showing that one pass, uh, one gets a huge uh, coverage. Uh, from an AUV. So how does that work? That's that's really the interesting part of this all. How does that 2D uh, data, uh, you know, get get to be collected at the same time as collecting this 3D forward-looking uh, asymmetry? Well, let me explain the the, the general concepts here. Um, first of all, this is how the receiver is constructed. The receiver has a 200 and 635 transmitter that can transmit either of one of those frequencies at any given time and can ping pong between the two. The receiver underneath has four arrays in total, one single array for 635, so that's why you get a 2D image because you only have one plane that you're looking in, and three separate arrays all wired up individually to the electronics to provide uh, the height determination on the 200 kilohertz. So the 2D image uh, is formed uh, as any uh, standard forward-looking multi-beam sonar would, would work. You can see uh, the ping is sent and the backscatters are received over time and the sonar records that uh, over the ping cycle. Uh, the first part of the ping cycle, you'll see very little returns because you're basically looking at uh, yeah, very low uh, intensity scatters or backscatters from the water column. You'll see a curve or an arc typically where you get the first seabed returns and then you'll get your, your, your backscatters from your main, main lobe across the, the, the seabed and through the water column. And you'll see shadow detail on, um, on, on objects and structures on the, on the water column. That of course doesn't give you any height information. You're only seeing an image that's compressed into two dimensions. Um, the illustration here shows a sonar um, illustration at 15 meters of water depth. So this is the situation here with a 25 degree downward tilt. It's probably a bit more downward tilt than one would typically use on an AUV. 
In this example, uh, the F30 is insonifying an area of almost 7,000 square meters. So again, roughly the size of a, of a football field, and in this case, a soccer field actually, which is a bit bigger than the US football field, quite a bit wider. And um, you're getting quite a wide, uh, you know, a long track coverage, 60, 80 meters on each side, 120 to 160 meters in total of, of coverage. How do you get heights on objects though? to get the symmetry. Well, what happens is the beamformer, the receiver beamformer, isolates uh, a, a sector. So these 112 beams, here's an example of one beam, one RX beam shown in blue here. And what you're doing is you're isolating uh, an across track sector essentially with this narrow beam. The interferometer, the interferometer then is able to pick up a target which is based on an echo and a phase delay. And we can use these three arrays in their very unique pattern to get a phase delay between the return signals on each individual array. The layout of the receivers allows us to uniquely identify the angle of arrival based on the phase within this wide uh, insonified volume. So this is what the receiver is doing in detecting the phase difference and applying some really clever mathematics. And the methodology is applied to all samples in all beams, in all 112 beams along the full range. And at the very high, you know, 33 kilo sample rate, we're getting a huge amount of data. Hundreds of thousands of detection points are gathered from each single ping. So it's a huge amount of data that's being processed. On the left-hand side uh, image here, you're seeing essentially what this raw uh, Bernier output. So Bernier process is a, is a resolu resolution enhancing process. And that's what the raw data looks like. You see a lot of noise uh, within the, the, the until you get the, the, the first return on the seabed. So to close towards the sonar on the, on the swap, you see very noisy data because there's essentially no returns to, to detect phase on. And further out in range, you also see noise when the sonar uh, is, is sort of running out of detection uh, uh, detection threshold or the ability to discriminate the phase difference. Of course, I've, I've enhanced the scale. I've over-exaggerated it just to show uh, and force my point here. One wouldn't use the sonar in this setting typically. We also provide a filtered burning output. And one can see here that in the center display, uh, center image here, that I've chosen a plus minus 10 degree around the array center and suppressed all the signal or all the angles below that and made them in a red scale. So you can now more cleanly identify the bathymetry, which is in this case shown as an angle, depression angle or angle of elevation relative to the sonar. And this input, these two inputs, these are sonar outputs, are sonar outputs, right? These come in real time from the sonar. Those can be provided or pushed into Teleline PBS, our data processing package, and used to generate real-time bathymetry on the fly using position navigation input like heading and attitude. Um, and, and one can generate this by a process where PBS is essentially cubing the data. So we're getting a hugely overdetermined uh, data set because each ping is providing us bathymetry for a wide swap. That's not normal. Normally, uh, bathymetry sonars that are looking down will get essentially one, one swap uh, per ping and then move ahead. Here, because you're looking out ahead of the AUV, you're able to resolve the seabed multiple times and, and then get a, a data set that you can do statistics on. So again, just to force my point here, what's unique about this is you're getting bathymetry ahead of your AUV. So if you don't know uh, what the bathymetry is in the area, you can reduce the risk of running into the seabed. You can also use this bathymetry as part of your navigation solution to help guide your AUV and make smart decisions about what to do. So diving into some examples of recent data we've collected using this uh, processing chain all the way through to PDS. Uh, here's examples. Uh, a lot of hydrographers and other people who are used to looking at acoustic data like sand waves on the seabed. And this, I think, gives a really good impression of the resolution of the system. The depth scale on this uh, data set is between five meters to 15 meters depth. 
and it's quite clear to see that the uh, the sound waves are very well resolved with good uh, with low noise and good resolution. Um, even though this is a forward-looking interferometric processing system, it's looking uh, very much like the kind of data that one would get from from a, a, a typical IHO hydrographic sonar. Even though that's not the main purpose of the sonar, right? We're not trying to replace hydrographic sonar. We're doing something different here. Um, and this data was actually collected from a surface vessel. So in this application, we were forced to tilt the sonar further down and we probably had more motion than we would normally have from an AUV. So this was actually quite a challenging uh, application. Here's another example. This data was processed and gathered uh, using real-time processing in satellite PDS. Again, water depths uh, on the region of nine and a half to 15 meters of water gathered in the Roskilde of Fjord in Denmark. So that's where the Viking Museum is in Denmark. And just for a sense of scale, here's an uh, image in the Little Belt region of Denmark where we went under a bridge and you can see the resolution right up to the, the piling. So really impressive performance for a forward-looking interferometric system. Anybody who's familiar with interferometric side scans would know that they typically have a hard time getting a lot of resolution, a lot of detail on vertical structures and on small structures. Um, the power of this forward-looking uh, way of doing it is that we have so many beams and the beams are so narrow that we get really good resolution um, all the way up on structures. And not to forget that the sonar is also a highly capable 2D sonar at the 635 and that one can ping pong between the different modes. Uh, here's a data set with a 80 meter range scale and what you're seeing is a harbor area with pylons and really good shadow resolution and shadow detail. Uh, again, highlighting the good uh, side load level behavior of the sonar. And the same data set can also be viewed in real time as a video. And I'd like to stress that generally speaking, when looking at sonar videos on a webinar like this, or looking at it uh, as video files afterwards, you're never gonna see the true uh, resolution of the sonar because the sonar display is just more crisp uh, in, in, in real life. Um, and in fact, even the sonar display, uh, as the operator sees it, can sometimes uh, essentially underplay at the resolution of the sonar, remembering that the sonar can have up to 66,000 samples per second in our, in our sampling. So advanced users can use a sonar like this as a platform to develop applications. Um, using our 7K DFD uh, format, you can go in and grab the data from the sonar for each beam and, and really do a lot more processing with it uh, as some of our customers do on a regular basis. And just to show some of, some examples here, uh, here we have uh, this is actually an, an excerpt from that data set where you see uh, tires, so these are car tires on the seabed. Uh, the range scale on this is about 60 meters, and here you're seeing a number of car tires, and you can clearly see the circular nature. You can see the the reflection from inside the car tire, and uh, and 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 just how well the sonar can resolve objects like this, which are not easy to resolve. Uh, they're not necessarily hard reflectors. And they've probably been on the seabed for a long time, so they'll be covered by some growth and maybe a bit buried as well in the soft sediment. So this is really impressive in, uh, performance, uh, showing very low noise and very good to, ability to detect targets in the seabed. So in summary, and leaving a few minutes for questions, um, what really is so special about the sonar and why my why I allowed myself to, to call it a very unique sonar is the fact that it is so compact, that it's a multi-purpose sonar and that it's optimized for UV platforms. This unique combination of high resolution imaging and forward-looking bathymetry really allows users to do things like get superb resolution on, on long ranges for detection of objects using this forward-looking bathymetry to aid uh, AUV navigation on the fly to, uh, you know, large AUVs these days are really expensive, but they're expected to go out and do missions for hours, days, maybe even weeks at times. Um, a sonar like this can be used as part of the uh, obstacle avoidance 
but also ultimately because you're able to get a map of the seabed, you can do more advanced uh, applications uh, comparing maps to previous maps to help navigation. And I think also the sonar in combination with the side scan sonar suite would be really unique because we can do gap fill. We can use the 2D imagery to do high resolution gap fill and PDS, our Teleline PDS software has a module that can support that. Um, and this ability to do co-registration of imagery and bathymetry in a fast alternating way, pinging between the two modes can really allow one to uh, place the, the, the uh, imagery in the context of the bathymetry as well, which is quite unique. So in summary, replacing multiple sensors with one will save you space, will save you weight and power and simplify interfacing and integration because we take care of it in one sonar system rather than yourself as an AUV integrator or customer having to deal with multiple sensors on your platform. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was interesting. Hello, are there any questions? Thank you, Simon. Yes, there are a few questions. Um, I can start with uh, the first one here. So it says, is the product ITAR? No, the product is not ITAR. It's commercial dual use and currently does not require a license for export to most uh, countries. So it's actually uh, because it's based on our standard COTS uh, technologies, uh, we, we have a fair freedom to export it. I would also say there's other benefits there too, uh, because it's based on the same platform as the CBAT T series. We have uh, a lot of experience building this platform. It means that it's uh, really cost effective. It also means that it's a uh, very robust and uh, yeah, well-known technology. So that's some added benefits as well. Another question, Helen? Thank you. Yeah, I've got here that says aspect radio with of swatch for height of the bed. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure I understand that question, but I think the the, the question is relation is is asking um, how much swath coverage do you get versus uh, versus how high you fly, and I think that's a difficult question to answer. But in reality, it um, AEV users will typically be flying maybe five meters or 10 meters, they may optimize based on the side scan package they have as well. So there's some trade-off to be made there. Um, to answer that question properly, we would probably uh, speak with that individual customer. So they're welcome to reach out to us and then do a simulation or a calculation of the coverage uh, based on their actual scenario, because it is quite a complicated uh, situation to, to, to sort of make a general reply on. I think the data we showed here uh, from our previous customer where they saw, you know, one pass giving uh, coverage of multiple numbers of football fields. That, that was probably the best indication you could get in a general sense in, in terms of having hundreds of meters of coverage, given the right situation. Other questions, Thank Helen? You, Simon. Yes, I have an, a question here. So in terms of accuracy, is it possible to compare the forward-looking bathymetry with the bathymetry from the hydrographic multi-beams? Um, it's possible to, to do comparisons. Um, I would I would caution one though, and to say that comparison is that this sonar is not intended as a as a hydrographic sonar. So we haven't qualified it against IHO requirements. We haven't done all the usual work that we would do on the T series, the T50, the T20, because th this is not the the primary application of the sonar. Um, having said that, it does provide very good resolution. It's, uh, uh, we could do some comparisons, but the primary application of the sonar is, is really in the forward-looking bathymetry for aiding the navigation or aiding the, 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 the essentially the flying of the AUV and avoiding seabed. Uh, but of course, the mapping or potential to use the output as a mapping through PDS is, is something we can talk with customers about, definitely. Okay. Do we have time for more questions? I have a few more here. Um, uh, we're yeah. running up to the hour. Yeah. Um, so I have one here that said, what is the output of bathymetry? Is it range bearings? So, so the, out, the, the native output of the sonar itself can be either ranges and elevation angles, which essentially are 
sonar relative, right? So the, the angle versus the sonar. If one inputs, uh, the, the sonar user interface is actually able to take in a setting for the angle, the tilt angle, how much you tilted the sonar down. If that's set in the sonar user interface, then the sonar user interface will actually give you a profile in meters. So you'll then know how many meters uh, below the AUV the, the seabed is. But when you're looking at really going over into trying to get understanding in, in let's say, real world coordinates, uh, then you probably want to bring in some of the PDS to, to take all the lever arms and the motion and position into account because that's really more than the sonar should be used for. The sonar is designed to be a sensor uh, providing data in a sonar-centric uh, sort of context. So I hope I answered that question well. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Uh, we're now running two minutes over time. Um, do you want to answer more questions or will you take the rest? Totally, totally up to you, Hella. Okay, I'll take one more here and that'll be the last question then. So this is uh, the F30 technology, will it replace the Teledyne BlueView underwater scanner? Oh, that was a... No, no actually, it's, it's a good question. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of quite, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm the product manager of BlueView as well. So I have a quite balanced view on it. No, it won't. Um, it's very different technology. The BlueView uses a frequency sweep technology um, that has other benefits, right? The BlueView sonar gives very high resolution, but the way that we sweep the frequency um, uh, means that the, that the range is more limited in comparison to the, the, the F30 because it's running at higher frequency over a wider bandwidth. Um, the BlueView sonars also don't give this very unique uh, 2D, uh, sorry, 3D forward-looking bathymetry. So in reality, the BlueView sonars definitely have their niche in the low power, smaller AUVs, uh, diver handhelds and things like that. So they're definitely com complementary and there's, there's no real intention to, to, to sort of obsolete the one with the other. In fact, what we've actually done is we've made improvements to the BlueView technology using technology from, from the CPAP sonars. So the recent release of the BlueView Mark II sonars includes uh, array technology and best practices used throughout the CBAT products because we have the same development team working on all products now. So um, yeah, BlueView will hopefully live a very strong life going ahead as will the CBAT brand for their different applications and, and niches. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. And do you have any last remarks? No, it was a pleasure presenting. I hope I did the product justice and uh, wish everybody a good day. Thank you very much and thank you for attending. Bye-bye.